This is the metaphysics of war, battle, victory, and death in the world of tradition by Julius Evola. Now, I must apologize that this is going to be read from an ebook edition, as I do not presently retain a hard copy of this text. On the second page, we have a, another title, Metaphysics of War, and yet another title page following, Metaphysics of War, Battle, Victory, and Death in the World of Tradition, by Julius Evola, Arctos MMXI. On the next page, we have credits. This English edition, published in 2011, in 2011 by Arctos Media Limited. First edition, published in 2007 by Integral Tradition Publishing. Second edition, published in 2008 by Integral Tradition Publishing. Copyright C, 2011, Arctos Media Limited. No part of this book may be reproduced or utilized in any form or by any means, in brackets, whether electronic or mechanical, closing bracket, including photocopying, recording, or by any information storage and retrieval system without permission in writing from the publisher. I would... no comment. <laughs> Printed in the United Kingdom, ISBN number 978-1-9071-66-36-5. BIC classification, social and political philosophy, in brackets, HPS, closing bracket, theory of warfare and military science, in brackets, JWA, closing bracket, philosophy of religion, in brackets, HRAB, Harab, closing bracket, editor, John B. Morgan, cover design, Andreas Nilsson, layout, Daniel Freiberg, Arctos Media Limited, and then they have the company website, www.arctos.com. We next have a table of contents, although unfortunately the page numbers for these are not listed, likely due to this being an ebook edition. So we have the introduction, followed by the forms of warlike heroism, the, scare, the, uh, the sacrality of war, the meaning of the Crusades, the Great War and the Lesser War, the metaphysics of war, army as a vision of the world, race and war, two heroisms. Next, race and war, the Aryan conception of combat, soul and race of war, the Aryan doctrine of combat and victory, the meaning of the warrior element for the new Europe, varieties of heroism, the Roman conception of victory, liberations, and finally, the decline of heroism. Here we have an introduction by John B. Morgan IV. The Julius Evola to be found in this volume is one who has, thus far, remained largely unknown to English-speaking readers, apart from how he has been described second-hand by other writers, namely the political Julius Evola. With the exception of Men Among the Ruins, which defines Evola's post-war political attitude, as well as the essays made available online and in print from the Evola As He Is website, all of Evola's works, which have been translated into English prior to the present volume, have been his works on esotericism. And this is the side of his work with which English language readers are most familiar. The essays contained in this book were written during the period of Evola's engagement with both Italian fascism and German National Socialism. And while Evola regarded those, these writings as being only a single aspect, and by no means an aspect of primary importance of his work. It is for these writings that he is most often called to account, and then in brackets, and nearly always harshly condemned, in the court of the Academ 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 Academician, Academ Academ it should say academics, but academicians, and professional historians.
For this reason alone, then, it is of great value that these essays are made available so that English-speaking readers can now form their own opinion of Evola's work in this area. And for those who are interested in Evola as a teacher, then these essays shall serve to open up an area of his work that, is hither that has hitherto remained largely inaccessible, and which contains a great deal of practical advice for the traditionally minded student. It is important to remember, while reading these essays, however, that Evola himself made no distinction between the various areas of culture with which he chose to engage, areas which have been artificially divided from each other by the philosophy of modernity, which treats the entire body of universal knowledge as a creature to be dissected and examined, one organ at a time, beneath a microscope, and thus each part of the creature's body is only understood as a thing in unto itself, without any understanding of how it relates to the whole. Evola's approach to knowledge was traditional, and therefore it was integrated in nature. It was integrated in nature. For him, there was always one and only one subject, tradition, which his friend René Guillon had first defined it, is the timeless and unchanging esoteric core which lies at the heart of all genuine spiritual paths. Traditionalism, a term which Evola himself never used, refers to the knowledge and techniques derived from sacred texts that the individual can use to orient himself in order to know tradition, and in knowing it, thereby live all aspects of his life in accordance with it. Politics was only of interest to Evola in terms of how the pursuit of certain political goals could be of benefit towards the spiritual advancement of a traditionally minded individual, and also in terms of how the distrustful and distasteful business of politics might be able to bring modern societies closer into line with the values and structures to be found within the teachings of traditional thought. During the 1930s, two political phenomena seemed to bear some hopeful possibilities for him in terms of how they might be utilized as vehicles for the restoration of something at least approximating a traditional society namely Italian fascism and German National Socialism, in brackets, Nazism. At no point, however, was Evola a starry-eyed, fanatical revolutionary filled with the idealistic enthusiasm for the cause. Indeed, in 1930, he wrote about fascism to the extent to which fascism embraces and defends traditional ideals. We shall call ourselves fascists, and this is all. There is a citation here, which regrettably I can't actually read to you because this being an audiobook, sorry, an e-book, it's been reformatted to be at the very end of the text. Actually, if I click on the link, perhaps, let me see here. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> Quoted by Evola himself in the path of Cinnabar, London, Arctos, 2009, page 106. Yes. So for these citations, it might be somewhat irritating, but nonetheless, we shall get through it. Reflecting on his political engagements later in life, he further wrote, Philosophy, art, politics, even religion, were here stripped of any right and possibility to exist merely in themselves and to be of any relevance outside a higher framework. This higher framework coincided with the very idea of tradition. My goal was to defend ideals unaffected by any political regime, be it fascist, communist, anarchist, or democratic. These ideals transcend the political sphere, and yet, when translated on the political level, they necessarily lead to qualitative differences, which is to say, to hierarchy, authority, and imperium in the broad, broader sense of the word, as opposed to all forms of democratic and egalitarian turmoil. This quoted as being Ibid, page 106, meaning it is also from the previous citation, which is The Path of Cinnabar, London Arctos, 2009. Now then, back to the text. <clears throat> 
Uh, here we go. Taking all of Evola's comments into account, both before and after the war, we never considered him, he, sorry, he never considered himself to be very much of a fascist. He understood from the beginning that both fascism and national socialism were thoroughly modern in their conception. In 1925, Evola had already written that Italian fascism lacked a cultural and spiritual root, which it had only tried to develop after gaining power. Just as a newly rich man later tries to buy himself an education and a noble title. Okay, citation for that would be the uh, quoted in H.T. Hansen's introduction to Julius Evola, Men Among the Ruins, Rochester, Inner Traditions, 2002, page 36. Okay. He attacked the notions of patriotism that fascism tried to inculate into Italian society as mere sentimentality. He also condemned the violence which Mussolini was using against his political opponents. He labeled the fascist revolution as an ironic revolution. The citation for that is Ibid, page 36, meaning also from H.T. Hansen's introduction to Men Among the Ruins. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, here we are. We, um, <clears throat> he labeled the fascist revolution as an ironic revolution, which left far too much of the pre-existing political order untouched, a sentiment apparently shared by Hitler, who repudiated referred to Italian fascism with its odd blending of the dictatorial position of Il Duce with the fascist Grand Council and the traditional monarchy as a half-job. In later years, he was to obscure that, in strict cultural terms, however, the fascist revolution was simply a joke. <laughs> now, that's an interesting citation. Um, citation for that would be The Path of Cinnabar, page 114. Um, let's see. Where was I? Ah, uh, here we are. Both fascism and national socialism relied on the masses for their support, which set them apart from the rule by the aristocracy of the traditional world. And national socialism was obsessed by the race theory derived from modern scientific concepts of evolution and biology, which were thoroughly anti-traditional. Given so many problems with fascism and Nazism from a traditional perspective, then why did Evola ever show any interest in them at all? The answer lies in the spirit of the times. By the 1930s, it was clear that the democratic nations of Western Europe and the United States, the communist Soviet Union, and the fascistic countries were all on a collusion course with each other. And despite their many flaws, the fascist movements unlike democratic and communist societies, were at least attempting to restore something akin to the traditional hierarchical order within the social structure of the modern world, an order which had gone unquestioned throughout the histories of all civilizations for thousands of years prior to the onset of, moder of modernity. <clears throat> While fascism and national socialism were thoroughly modernist in their conception, Evola believed that, given time, they could potentially be used as a gateway to re-establish an order in Europe based on genuinely traditional values, and that they might eventually give rise to genuinely traditional social forms which would supersede them. It is in this context that these essays, some of which contain direct references to fascism being addressed to either Italian or German readerships as they originally were, should be understood. Evola's political ideal was always the Roman Empire. It is, evoked, repeat, it is invoked repeatedly throughout these essays. The fascists spoke frequently about ancient Rome, just as the Nazis constantly invoked the myth of an idealized Nordic past. Their understanding of these ancient wonders, however, was of an extremely superficial sort which in practice did not extend beyond constructing new buildings in the style of the ancient world, 
and engendering artistic styles that were a mere imitation of the classical era. Evola <clears throat> wanted to bring about change on a much deeper level. He didn't just want a few cosmetic changes to be made. He wanted modern-day Italians to actually resume thinking and behaving as their ancient ancestors had done. In short, he wanted the Italians to become like the ancient Romans, in thought, word, and deed. This is why, for him, fascism fell far short of his hopes for it. In his writings, he sometimes referred to what he wanted as super-fascism. <laughs> By using this term, he did not mean that he wished for more of what fascism was already offering. Rather, he was calling for a transcendence of fascism. He wanted for the fascist revolution to tunnel inward into the very soul of each individual Italian and awaken the long-buried racial memory of their illustrious imperial ancestors. When Italy disappeared from, sorry, when Italy disappointed him, he transferred his hopes to the Germans particularly in the form of the Schutzstaffel SS, which, with Heinrich Himmler's efforts to fashion it into something akin to a medieval knightly order, seemed to hold a spark of the ancient Teutonic knights within them. Evola was even in invited to deliver a series of lectures to representatives of the SS leadership in 1938. However, the SS was fixated upon the Nazis' purely biological definitions of racial purity and their belief in the supremacy of the Nordic peoples, and as such they were unimpressed by the ideas of the Latin Evola, who proposed the idea that spirit and character were as important to one's racial qualifications as ancestry and blood. He was politely sent away. As such, Evola's hope to influence the political forces of the period in such a way as to implement his plan for the spiritual and cultural regeneration of Europe was never to be realized. The failure of Evola's efforts, however, should in no way be understood as reducing the relevancy of the essays in this volume to mere relics of purely historical interest. Evola's writing was always directed at the individual, and he believed that genuine change had to begin at this level before any meaningful political or social change could follow suit. Furthermore, the root of all of Evola's thinking lay in the unchanging world of tradition. Therefore, the attitudes and orientations which he encouraged his readers to adopt as a way of preparing for the worldwide struggle of his time are just as relevant to a traditionally minded individual preparing to steal himself for the struggles and conflicts of our own era. Whether they are political or of an entirely different sort, the definitions of heroism and the qualities of the warrior that Evola describes herein are surely timeless and universal indeed. In various, sorry, are, and universal. Indeed, in varieties of heroism, one can easily see in the phenomenon of today's Muslim suicide bombers a suprapersonal heroism of a type identical to that of the Japanese kamikaze pilots that Evola describes. While it would not be correct to label today's Islamist radicals as traditionalists, since their particular interpretation of Islam has modern as modernist roots in the 19th century Salafi school, we can still see some elements of a traditional conception of the warrior in their actions and deeds. For instance, Evola describes at great length the concept of jihad, which, as he explains, involves an inner struggle against one's own weakness as well as the struggle against one's external enemies, those whose characteristics resemble those aspects of himself that the warrior is attempting to purge. Regrettably, this dual concept of jihad as consisting of an inward as well as an outward form of struggle has been rejected by today's Islamist radicals, who believe that the war against the infidels should take precedence over all other considerations. Fortunately, however, the dual understanding of jihad is still to be found among the Islamic mystics, the Sufis, who may very well be the last guardians of a traditional Islam in the modern world. Despite these differences, however, 
an attack carried out by an Islamist suicide bomber still retains the essential idea of self-sacrifice and yearning for transcendence that is to be found in the traditional warrior concept in varieties of heroism. Evola explains why those Japanese kamikaze pilots who died while crashing their planes into American ships should not be regarded as suicides, since the pilots carried out these attacks with the belief that they were merely giving up this life in favor of a more transcendent and suprapersonal existence. Given that Muslim suicide bombers similarly believe that they are destined for paradise as a result of their actions, the subject Sorry, the objection to such attacks on the basis of the Quran's prohibition against suicide is therefore ludicrous. Such was indeed the motivation behind the famed Ismail, Ismaili assassins of Alamut who terrorized the Islamic world, as well as the armies of the European Crusaders, for centuries. The assassins carried out carefully planned attacks on individual enemies without regard for the safety of the assassin. And, as such, the technique of the suicide attack was their hallmark. The assassins were always assured, however, that even if they were to die during the course of their attack, they would be rescued by angels and sent to dwell in paradise forever. Although the assassins, who were a small offshoot of Shiism, are regarded as heretics by other Muslims, we can see the roots, in brackets, or perhaps only a parallel, of today's suicide bombers in their practices, which is entirely consistent with Evola's description of the supra-personal mode of death in combat. It is important for me to clarify that I am referring only to those attacks carried out against military or political targets. The mass, the mass casualty attacks on civilians, which have become an all too common occurrence in Iraq and elsewhere in the Islamic world in recent years, are alien to the provisions of war laid out in traditional Islam, and can be justified only within the modern, innovative doctrines of takfir, in which one can declare other Muslims to be apostates, or jah jahiliyaya, which regards fellow Muslims as living in a state of pagan ignorance. It is likewise forbidden in the Quran to attack the civilian population even of one's enemy something which the Islamists have had to perform theological acrobatics to circumvent in order to justify their bloody attacks on the West. Certainly, such murderous behavior, which is usually perpetrated out of desperation by individuals chosen from the lowest rungs of society, is not something which Evola would have defined as traditional or seen as desirable, even in opposition to societies he found detestable in nature. Evola's, sorry, Evola's ideal was that of the uh, Kish, uh, Kishatriya, described by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, which has been explained by A.C. Bhakt, Bhaktivedanta Dante Swami uh, Prabhupada as follows. One who gives protection from harm is called Krishatriya. Uh, Krish, Krishatraya. The Krishatraya are especially trained for challenging and killing because religious violence is sometimes a necessary factor. In the religious law books, it is stated, in the battlefield, a king or Krishatraya, while fighting another king envious of him, is eligible for achieving the heavenly planets after death. As the Brahmanas also attain the heavenly planets by sacrificing animals in the sacrificial fire. Therefore, killing on the battlefield on religious principles and killing animals in the sacrificial fire are not at all considered to be acts of violence, because everyone is benefited by the religious principles involved. And the citation for that is A.C. Bahak Tivandante Swami Prabhupada, uh, this is all not in English, I'll try my best here, Bhagavad Gita, as it is, in brackets, Mumbai, Bhaktivedanta Book Trust, 2008, Chapter 2, Text 31, uh, page 105. Now then...
let's see, back to the text. And I must admit, the way this is formatted is infuriating. Um, where was I? Hmm. Uh, ah, here we are. A uh, Krishtraya, therefore, is not an ordinary man, but rather a man of the highest aristocratic attitude and behavior. He does not kill out of a desire to fulfill some selfish desire or to bring about some temporary political gain. Rather, a Krishtraya fights because he knows that it is the reason for his existence, his dharma. He fights to defend the principles of his religion and his community, knowing that if he carries out his duty, regardless of victory or defeat, or even his own personal safety, he is destined to attain the highest spiritual platform. But unfortunately, few genuine Krishtrayas are to be found in the de uh, degenerate Kali Yuga in which we are now living. While Evola looked to the past for his understanding of the genuine warrior, Evola was far ahead of his time in his understanding of politics, as were all of the conservative revolutionaries in Europe during the period between the wars who sought a form of politics beyond the banal squabbles among parties that have dominated in recent centuries. In our time, however, we find that the ideas first outlined by Evola and others are finding new appeal amongst those seeking an alternative to the seemingly unstoppable global spread of democratic capitalism. As more people grow tired of the bland, multicultural, or more properly, anti-cultural, consumer society that is being offered as a vision of utopia, it seems likely that Evola's writings will only continue to increase in relevance as the cracks of social crisis continue to deepen, in particular, the meaning of the warrior element for the new Europe contains a number of insights which are just as relevant today as they were in 1941. In this essay, Evola discusses the First World War in the context of democratic imperialism and the attempt by the Allies to put an end to the last vestiges of the traditional way of life that were embodied in the Central Powers. We see the exact same phenomenon at work today in the efforts of the United States of America to spread freedom through military action in the Middle East and elsewhere, which is similarly designed to put an end to resistance in the last areas of the world which are still actively opposing the culture of materialism with traditional values. As such, we are now witnessing another case of democratic imperialism, by which the present-day democratic powers having already succeeded in Europe, are attempting to destroy the last vestiges, in brackets, and only a vestige given how profoundly impacted by modernity the entire world has been over the last century, of the traditional concept of order. These forces will not be defeated through military means, however, but only by those who choose to embody the ideal of the warrior inwardly as well as outwardly. The world of tradition being a realm which no amount of force or wealth can subdue. This introduction will not contain a biographical summary of Evola's life, as that has already been done extensively by several writers elsewhere in the English language, in brackets, most notable particularly in terms of his political attitudes, is Dr. H. T. Hansen's Introduction to Men Among the Ruins as well as in Evola's autobiography, The Path of Cinnabar. However, given that these essays are concerned primarily with war, it is worth mentioning that Evola did not understand war in a purely theoretical sense. Evola served as a military, sorry, Evola served as an artillery officer in the Italian army during the First World War and he would have served again in the Second World War had not the controversial nature of his position in fascist Italy intervened to prevent him from doing so. Evola practiced what he wrote. This is no more evident than in his essay, Race and War, a passage from which seems like a premonition of the fate that will befall him in 1945, when he was injured and paralyzed for life from the waist down as a result of an air raid while he was working in Vienna. <clears throat> in it, 
Evola mentions a German article about bombing raids by aircraft in which the testing of sang Freud, the immediate lucrid reaction of the instinct of direction in, oppose, in opposition to brutal or confused impulse, cannot be result in a cannot but result in a decisive discrimination of those who have the greatest probability of escaping and surviving from those who do not. Here we may indeed be catching a glimpse of the thinking behind his refusal to retreat to shelters during air raids, instead choosing to walk the streets as a test of his own fate. Lastly, a word about where these essays originally appeared. In 1930, Evola established a bi-weekly journal of his own, La Torre, which was to focus on the critique of fascism from a traditionalist perspective, written by Evola as well as other writers. His attacks on the failures of fascism angered many in the fascist establishment. However, and the uh, sorry, his attacks on the failures of fascism angered many in the establishment, however, and the authorities forced a halt to the publication of La Torre after only five issues. Evola therefore realized that if he wanted to continue to attempt to reach an audience of those who might be sympathetic to his message of reform, he would need to find well-connected fascist allies who would be willing to publish his writings. And in this effort, he succeeded. This is the period to which nearly all of the essays in this book belong. Evola found an important ally in Giovanni Preziosi, who was the editor of the magazine La Vita Italiana, in brackets, See Varieties of Heroism. Preziosi's publication was also sometimes critical of the fascist regime, but Preziosi himself had earned Mussolini's trust and respect, and was thus allowed more freedom of content than most others. In brackets, according to Evola, it was also rumored that Preziosi uh, possied, uh, possessed an archive of materials which, if made public, would embarrass many of the fascist leaders. Closing bracket, and the citation for that statement. Um, the Path of Cinnabar, page 110. Now to try and find where I left off here. Uh, let's see. Um, ah, here we are. Preziosi had been an admirer of Evola's La Torre, and he was also a friend of Arturo Reggini, the great Italian esotericist who had been Evola's mentor and collaborator when he first began studying spirituality and mysticism. He agreed to begin publishing Evola's writings in his own journal, and starting in 1936, he also funded many of Evola's trips to other countries, which he was making in an effort to build a network of contacts from among various conservative revolutionary organizations all over Europe, in keeping with his hopes at the time of preparing a European rather than a narrow Italian elite which might one day implement his super-fascist or, as he himself put it, Ghibellin ideals for the entire continent. Evola himself wrote, My idea was that of coordinating the various elements which to some extent in Europe embodied traditionalist thought from a political and cultural perspective. And the citation for that is The Path of Cinnabar, page 155. Okay, hang on a moment. Okay. Um, oh, here we are. This desire is quite evident within the pages of this book. As Evola constantly refers to Aryan civilization and cities' references from the whole of European culture and history, rather than focusing exclusively on the Italian tradition. As most fascist writers with their more conventional sense of nationalism were doing. Preziosi also introduced Evola to Roberto Farinazzi, Farinacci, 
Farinacci was a fascist who had a personal relationship with Mussolini, and he was the chief editor of Il Regime Fascista, in brackets, see the first six essays, as well as the Roman concept of victory. A journal which was as a, an official publication of the fascist party. Ferracini was indifferent to Evola's past troubles with the regime, and he sought to elevate the cultural aspirations of the fascist revolution. To this end, he granted Evola a page of his journal every other week, in which he was given carte blanche to write on whatever subject he wished. Carte blanche in this context, I believe, would mean basically free reign, write whatever you want. This page, which began to appear in 1933, was entitled Diorama Philosofi Philosofico, in brackets, Philosophical Diorama. And it was subjected, so it was subtitled Problems of the Spirit in Fascist Ethics. Farasini used his influence to deflect any attempt to rebuke Evola for writing about fascism from a critical perspective. So it was that Evola was given an unassailable position from which to voice his observations. This situation was to continue for a full decade until 1943. Frequently, Evola wrote the contents of the diorama himself, but he also used it as a forum to highlight like-minded thinkers of both a literary as well as a political inclination, whom he wished to promote. Thus, by examining the history of Evola's efforts to publish politically-oriented texts during the fascist era, we can understand the complexity of his relationship to fascism in general, and thus see why it cannot be said with complete accuracy that Evola was either a fascist or an anti-fascist. The most truthful answer is that Evola saw in fascism a possibility for something better, but that this possibility was one that remained unrealized. For those newcomers to Evola who are seeking to understand the totality of his thought, these essays are not the ideal place to start. The foundation of all of his work is the book which was published shortly before the essays in this volume were written, namely, Revolt Against the Modern World. This book lays out the metaphysical basis for all of his life's work, and one should familiarize himself with it before reading any of Evola's other writings. It should also be made clear that these essays were by no means Evola's last word on the subject of politics. Readers interested in where Evola's political thought ended up in the post-war years should consult his book Men Among the Ruins, in which he outlines his understanding of the concept of apolitea, or the apolitical stance, which he felt was necessary well, sorry, which he felt was a necessary condition for those of a traditional inclination to adopt in the age of Kali Yuga, the last and most degenerate age within the cycle of ages as understood by the Vedic tradition and in which we are currently living. A politeia should not be confused with the apathy or lack of engagement, however. It is instead a special form of engagement with political affairs that does not concern itself with the specific goals of politics, but rather with the impact of such engagement on the individual. This is not the place for an examination of this idea, however, as the essays in this book were written by a younger Evola, who felt that there was still a chance of restoring something of the traditional social order via the use of profane politics. Still, it is worth noting that in the very last essay of this volume, The Decline of Heroism, which was written not long before Men Among the Ruins, we can see something of the state of Evola's mind immediately after the war. Pessimism was something always alien to Evola's conception of life, but in this essay we can see Evola surveying the, politi the political forces at work in 1950 and realizing that none of them can possibly hold any interest for those of a traditional nature. With the, construction, with, the with the destruction of the hierarchical and heroic vision of fascism, nothing was left to choose from on the political stage but the two competing ideologies of egalitarianism, democratic capitalism, and communism. Both of which, sorry, but the two competing ideologies of egalitarianism, namely democratic capitalism and communism. 
both of which sought to dehumanize the individual. Moreover, Evola observes that war in the technological age has been reduced to the combat between machinery, and as such, the opportunities for heroic transcendence offered by war in earlier times are no longer available. Therefore, the struggle for an individual seeking to experience heroism will not be one of politics or even of combat on the battlefield, but rather it will consist instead of the heroic individual in, in conflict with the phenomenon of total war itself, in which the idea of humanity faces possible annihilation. This is indeed the predicament in which we have all found ourselves since 1945, the year when humanity not only harnessed the ability to extinguish itself with the atomic bomb, but also began to face the prospect of becoming lost within ever-multiplying machinery of our own creation. With no significant political forces opposing the conversation, the conversation, the, sorry, pardon me, with no significant political forces opposing the conversion of our world into a universal marketplace, the conflict of our time is the struggle to retain one's humanity in an increasingly artificial world. That is the only battle that retains any genuine significance from a traditional perspective. Most of the footnotes to the texts were added by myself. A small number of footnotes added by Evola himself were included with some of the essays and have been so indicated. Now below we have the quotations and citations referenced above that were reformatted to be in this position, all of which have already been read prior. Now, I shall end this recording here, and we shall pick up where we've left off. The next section is titled, The Forms of Warlike Heroism. Thank you for joining us, and see you shortly.